God, it worked. Wow, I had a serious problem uh, this week. My uh, laptop gave up on me last uh, Tuesday. And so I was forced to buy a new laptop, so I'm using a new one here. And uh, so I lost about two days, three days, including yesterday, in my sermon preparation. And so this was a really a tough week for me. But praise God, we are able to uh, continue with our study of the book of Revelation. Amen. Are you excited to study the book of Revelation? Yes. Amen. We have entitled this series, The Beginning of the End, The Book of Revelation. And uh, friends, there are certain things that we cannot afford to misunderstand if we are to understand carefully the book of Revelation. So at least there are three keys that we need to uh, we need to hold, we need to use in order to understand the book of Revelation. I know that we're now on chapter 6, and you know chapter 6 is where we start uh, moving into the judgments, and this will be a very quick study, but uh, there are certain things that we need to have as a backdrop, as a background, in order to understand the significance of chapter 6 up to chapter 19. The first key that we need to uh, understand, of course, is the divine, uh, divine blueprint, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Now, that's a key when it comes to understanding the book of Revelation. That's easy to memorize. That's 911 reverse, you know, instead of 911, 119. So, Revelation 1, 19. And this is the, uh, the outline which God gave for us to understand the book of Revelation. Sorry. Right therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. And so here we have at least the three points in our outline. What you have seen is a chapter 1 where we have Christ who was unveiled. And that's the meaning of the word revelation. It's to unveil. And so John had this vision while he was there the island of Patmos on the day of the Lord. And uh, in our translations, it's the Lord's day. And a lot of people would assume that this is a Sunday. But after going through, uh, especially chapter uh, 4, 5, and then now chapter 6, the day, uh, the Lord's day should be translated the day of the Lord. And so he was just transported to that time when the day of the Lord uh, came about. And we're going to uh, understand what that, what that means, the phrase, the day of the Lord. And so he saw a vision of Christ, and so he made, uh, he wrote down the descriptions of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, we took note at least seven uh, descriptions about Christ, that he is the reigning Christ, the righteous Christ, revealing Christ, relentless Christ, regal Christ, revenging Christ, and then the resplendent Christ. And then, not only did he see things in his vision, he heard things, the Lord Jesus Christ gave his uh, evaluation of the churches and he focused on seven churches in Asia Minor and so this is the what is now the present the churches are now revealed they are now unveiled and uh, here we try to understand this in at least three ways you can understand it personally perennially and the most important in terms of studying the whole book is understanding it prophetically and so understanding it uh, perennially, we looked at this. Uh, Ephesus is busy, yet Bob's living church. It's merely suffering, yet steadfast. Pergamum continuing, yet compromising. Theatira, involved, yet immoral. Sardis is a distinguished church, and yet it's already dead. Not even aware that it's dead. Philadelphia, mistreated, yet missions minded church. And Laodicea, luxurious, yet lukewarm church. And uh, there are Christians who are like that, and perennially throughout church history, we've had churches who are like this. And even Christians can be described by those uh, statements. You can be busy and yet backslidden at the same time. You know, secretly you're busy for the Lord, but you know in your own heart that you're backslidden, suffering at steadfast. So those descriptions. But as I've said, in terms of the book of Revelation, I believe that the seven churches, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ chose the seven churches, despite the fact that there are about 100 churches throughout Asia uh, during this time, throughout the uh, Mediterranean area, Mediterranean world, more than 100 churches, 
He chose these seven churches because they actually represent the different church eras, the different uh, uh, periods in church history. So for example, um, sorry. So for example, here, Ephesus, the uh, prominent church, of course this, uh, this, this is the time when you had the apostles from 30 to 100 AD. 100 AD is significant because that's the year that you complete the, the New Testament and by that year all the apostles are now dead. Alright? So that's the prominent church. But Smyrna is the persecuted church after 100 AD. There were several emperors, at least 10 emperors, who made an empire-wide decree to persecute Christians. And so from 100 to 313 AD, 313 is the most significant year because that's the year supposedly uh, Emperor Constantine became a Christian and so Christianity was now legalized and it's a blessing at the same time it's a curse on Christianity because when it was legalized it became the state religion and that means the army got baptized can you imagine the whole army Roman army got baptized because the emperor is a Christian everybody should be a Christian and so there was mass baptism without conversion there were a lot of politicians they want to you know want some favor from the from constantine so they became christians so this was the time when uh, a lot of the pagan practices were seeping into christianity and so the uh, the time uh, the persecuted church 313 so permissive church is the third one pergamos and the name pergamos itself means marriage and so here you have the marriage of secular and sacred. And so the world got married to the church. And here you have the permissive church from 313 to 590. And so a lot of the pagan practices are now seeping into Christianity. And because it became a state religion, anybody who's not a Christian is against the state. And so you will be persecuted. So before Christians were being persecuted now, during 314 to 590, those who are not Christians, they are the ones who will be persecuted. And so then, next you have Tiatira. Tiatira means, the word means continual sacrifice. And here you have the Papal Church, 590 AD was the year where you begin to have the Roman Catholic system. Where you have the hierarchy of uh, the leadership up to the Pope, all right, the Papal Church. And this was also the uh, time, the Papal Church, when the, for the first time Christianity got, uh, got split into two. Because the, uh, the pastor at Constantinople, uh, the emperor at the time Constantine moved the capital from Rome, he moved it to a new city and they, he called it by his name, Constantinople. And so the pastor in that city became the prominent pastor now throughout the empire, and so he would uh, clash with the pastor in the church of Rome. And so they split. And so the church became the Greek Orthodox Church. Okay, so this is the first time we had a split. So you have the Roman Catholic Church in the in the Western in the Western world, and then on the eastern side of the empire, you have the Greek Orthodox Church. So basically they're the same. They're just different in terms of who's the head. Okay? So the Roman Catholic Church, the head is the Pope, while in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, the head is the Patriot, okay, the Patriot. So you have the Papal, Papal Church, and then Sardis is the Protestant Church. 1517 is again a very significant year because that's the year when an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther uh, rebelled against Star Rome. You know, one day he was walking, he was from Wittenberg in Germany, and he's He's a pastor, or he was the priest in that uh, church in Wittenberg, and at the same time teaching at the University of Wittenberg. And he was walking one time and he saw this drunk man on the streets of uh, Wittenberg, and he was uh, scolding him for drinking, you know, and sleeping on the floor. And the man said, Padre, it's okay. And he showed him, uh, he already bought his uh, indulgence, because during this time, the uh, church in Rome was raising funds to rebuild the uh, cathedral in Rome and uh, if you want to be saved you just buy this indulgence and then you are assured of going to heaven 
And so because of that, it was so repulsive in his own mind, he, he went back to the scriptures and he found while teaching the book of Romans and Galatians and the book of Psalms that the, the just shall live by faith alone. The just shall live by faith alone. And so that started the Protestant movement. They were protesting against these uh, abuses, especially those teachings that are against the Bible. So you have the Protestant church between 17 to, 50, to 1700. And this is the time when you had several Protestant churches in Germany. It was the Lutheran church. But again, you have a problem here because the Lutheran church came out, it became the state religion. And you know the problem when it becomes the state religion? Anyone who is not Lutheran is against the state. And so those who are not Lutheran, they'll be persecuted. And in Germany and in France, there were Anabaptists. Anabaptists, Anna means again, to baptize again. And so they did not believe in infant baptism, which the Lutheran church was practicing at that time. They did not uh, change uh, infant baptism. And they said, you know, baptism, water baptism should be a decision of the heart. An infant cannot make a decision. And so they said, we need to be baptized again. And so they were teaching but to be baptized again. They were against the Lutherans. And so they were persecuted. And many of them died. Okay, you want to be baptized again? So they would put them under the water until they died. And uh, so that's the, that's the history of the Anabaptists. And so you have that, uh, those Protestant churches, the Reformed Christian Church in, uh, in France and in other areas. Again, the same thing became a state religion. But from 1700 to 1900, this is the proclaiming church. This is the time when Christianity jumped into uh, the Americas, into North, North America, and everybody who's not a Lutheran, who's not, by the way, during that time also, the Anglican Church came into being. And the Anglican Church in Rome, they rebelled against the Pope because King Henry VIII, he wants to divorce his wife because his wife cannot get pregnant. And, you know, the monarchy, they need to have a son. And so the Pope did not allow him to divorce his wife. And so King Henry VIII said, hey, if that's the case, then I'll just have our own church. So he split the church again. He divided the Church of England, separated from the Church of Rome, and they had the Anglican Church with the king as the head of the church. And then he married his uh, wife. And uh, so it was very political. But then America was discovered, and people who were persecuted in England, in Germany, in France, they went to America because in America they started with the constitution, the separation of church and state. The church cannot sponsor religion. You can have your own religion. All right, and so you have here the proclaiming church 1700 to the 1900, and this is when the church just exploded because they they begin uh, they began sending missionaries abroad, and so you have the global outreach of the church proclaiming church, and then finally from 1900 up to the present, and we're still waiting for the rapture. You have the professing church, so many today are just professing Christians but not real Christians, they're actually lukewarm. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. And so you are so disgusting as a church, I'm just about to vomit you out. And so that's the professing church. So we are now in that stage, 1900 up to the time of the rapture. All right. So that's where chapter three ended. So Revelation chapter two and chapter three ended with these uh, uh, seven churches. And then chapter four, this is where we start the third portion, the third and last in the outline, Revelation chapter 4 to chapter 22, what will take place later. So now from chapter 4, it's all future, all right? It's not future, it's the consummation. It's a veil. And chapter 4, verse 1, it starts with this, after this, I looked, after these things, or get a thought, after these things. And so Jair is just recounting what he just experienced, and after these things, he said, after seeing Christ, after hearing Christ, now, he said, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. He had a new vision, and this time, it's the Lord Jesus Christ up there in heaven. So he was, he was ruptured to heaven. He was cut, cut away to heaven. So after these things, the last time it's mentioned there in verse 1, it says that after this, okay, after this, and then after this. So you see, the second after this is God's chronology. The first after this is John's chronology of events. And so God is saying to John, 
Come up here. Oops, I'm sorry. Come up here, and I will show you what you must, uh, what must take place after this. And that last after this is after the Church of Laodicea. All right. After the Church of Laodicea, which is the last church stage, this is where we have the uh, come up here, and I will show you what you must, uh, what must take place after this. And this is where we have the rapture. And so, friends, we talked about this, and uh, harpazo is the Greek word, but uh, uh, the, the Latin Vulgate, when it was translated into Latin, sorry, ra, rapimo, okay, right there, is the proper tense of rapio, and that's where we got the word rapture. And so the, the concept is there in the Bible, but the actual word rapture is not found in the Bible. And so we have harpazo, it's to be caught up. It's the catching away. And so we can gather the verses that talks about the coming of Christ. And you'll begin to sense that there seems to be two, two uh, different events here. And so you begin to go through these details. And you'll be able to discover that these two events, there's actually the uh, rapture side. I'm sorry. I'm having a problem here with my... Uh, with the rapture side and then the second coming side. And when you, dis when you uh, uh, differentiate these two events, there are details that they cannot be, uh, they cannot be reconciled under one event. And so this is uh, what we, we studied. In the rapture, there's the translation of believers. Well, no translation. With the second coming, mean, the translation means, you know, our bodies will be changed at the twinkling of an eye. The translated saints, they go to heaven. While the translated saints return to earth, and so the earth is not judged, while well, the earth is judged after the second coming. So we, we, go, we went through these uh, differences, and there are some more differences. The great tribulation is the next after uh, rapture, while well, second coming, the next event is the millennium, the 1,000 year reign of Christ. And so chapter 4, verse 1, talks about the, the rapture, where the church is taken to heaven, and uh, just like John, when the, Jesus said to him, come up here. And so in chapter 4 and chapter 5, John gives us a, a, a description of what he saw right there in the throne room of heaven. And in the throne room of heaven, in uh, chapter 4, we uh, took note of this, the prelude to the throne, the place of the throne, the, the person in the throne, the people around the throne, the power from the throne, the presence before the throne, and then the praise toward the throne. And John was just writing it down and so excitedly uh, describing what he was seeing. And we took note of uh, the different pictures there around the throne, particularly, I'm sorry, particularly these uh, four living creatures, those that with wings, you know, uh, they have six wings and uh, two covering the feet because they're, they are on, uh, on holy ground. And then the next two wings, it's covering their face because they cannot behold the, the full glory of God while with the two wings they can fly and hover like a helicopter. And so with six wings, four are devoted to worship and two for service. And friends, we took note of that and uh, there should be more worship than, uh, than uh, work or serving the Lord. And uh, last Sunday, we just focused on, uh, on worship. And so these uh, four creatures, very interesting, they have the face, uh, one has the face of a lion, the other has the face of an ox, the other has the face of a man, and then the other has the face of an eagle. And this can be uh, very uh, confusing if we are not students of the Old Testament. So this is where the Old Testament is very important. You see, there is one integrated design in the whole of the Bible. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, but the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And so once we understand this, then it's easier for us to picture what John was looking at. And we notice that these four, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, each of the 12 tribes, they have their own emblems, all right? The emblem for the tribe of uh, Judah was the lion. The emblem for the tribe of Ephraim was an ox. The emblem for the tribe of Reuben was a man. And the emblem for the tribe of Dan 
was an eagle. And so, just understanding the Old Testament and in Numbers chapter 2, when they encamp right there in the desert, before going to the promised land, God gave them special instructions. They counted themselves. These are the men, 20 years old and above. These are the fighting men. And so you have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. They were grouped into three. So one group has three tribes. The tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin, and then Reuben, Simeon, and God, and then Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. And so they were grouped into four. And uh, very interesting, the uh, instructions that were given to them, the camp of Judah, they are to... Uh, they are to encamp on the east of the Levites, the camp of Reuben on the south of the Levites, and there was a strict obedience not to camp on the southeast. So they, they need to be just behind the, uh, the Levites, and uh, the width of the Levites' camp, that's the width also that they have to maintain, and, and the length is proportional, of course, to the population that they have. And so that's the uh, camp area, the, the middle there is the tabernacle, and so there's only one gate facing east, and as the sun rises, and so there's uh, there's the gate to the uh, temple or the tabernacle at that time. And so in this inside, the Levites can come inside. All right, there are four groups of the Levites right there, the four families, and then the uh, tribe of Judah, together with the other two tribes, they have the emblem of the lion. And then, of course, the uh, tribe of Reuben, leading the other two tribes, had the emblem of man. On the southeast, nobody can camp there. And then on the uh, north side, or west side, you have the uh, tribe of Ephraim with the ox as its emblem. And then, of course, the tribe of Dan with eagle as its emblem. And then if we uh, took note of the uh, population of the men, I'm sorry, the number of men in each of the camp, and uh, Judah is the biggest number, so you have to include the number of women, so you times two, and then maybe add one, one child for its uh, family, at least one child for its family. And so if you take a helicopter selfie or a helicopter shot of this uh, camp, it would look like that, all right? And so this was what John was looking at. In the inside the temple or around the temple, it's the picture of a cross. And so there you have uh, the first description about these four living creatures. And then John also noticed not only the four living creatures, but he noticed that there were 12 thrones. All right? So you have the four living creatures, you have 12 thrones, and there are people sitting on it. And these people, they have crowns, and they were putting down their crowns before the uh, throne. And of course, we know now as we have studied the chapter. Uh, for in chapter 5 is that uh, these 24, by the way, 24 thrones, they represent the reigning, the redeemed, the rewarded, and the ruptured church. So this is the church that got ruptured. They are reigning with Christ. They are kings and priests. They are redeemed. They are wearing white gowns. And they are rewarded. They're wearing, uh, they, they have uh, crowns over their heads. And these crowns, there's the Stephanus. Uh, Stephanus, which are the uh, victor's crown, and this is the raptured church. And so there we have the picture of what John was seeing. So you have the four living creatures and then the 24 uh, thrones, or the 24 elders, as it is called. And they were singing a new song. And uh, this is what we looked at last Sunday, uh, Revelation chapter 9, 5, uh, 9, 10. It says, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be kingdom and priests. So those are the kings and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And so that completes the picture of chapters of four, uh, yeah, chapters four and five. And so John was just so uh, uh, amazed by this, looking at the, the, the glorious throne with all the lights that were shimmering and then there were, of course, uh, the thunder and then the lightning from the throne. And so there we have a picture of uh, the rapture church up there in heaven and worshiping God. And then last Sunday, 
John in chapter 5 focused on the hand of the one who seated on the throne and in that hand he saw a scroll okay so he saw the scroll and uh, this scroll is not a, a book type it's the uh, yeah the scroll type because it's made of papyrus and uh, the way it's prepared it's 8 by 10 inches and they are joined horizontally and so you'll be uh, unrolling them so for example uh, the book of Jude 2nd John and 3rd John and Philemon, that will only be one uh, sheet of uh, papyrus. The book of Romans is about 11 uh, and one half feet long. And then you can see the book of Revelation that down there, it's about 15 feet long. And so you have to roll it or unroll it if you want to read it. And so that's the book of Revelation, about 15 feet long uh, papyrus. And so as I've said, this uh, seal is placed right there and then uh, Things that you've written on top cannot be read unless you, you break the seal. And so you roll it again and write some more and then put another seal until you have seven seals all in all. And uh, we learned from our study last Sunday that seven, a seven sealed scroll is a legal scroll. Okay, this is a, uh, something that is a legal document, like a uh, title deed. And in fact, this is a title deed to the, uh, to the earth and the universe. The title deed that was given to Adam, but he forfeited it to Satan after he fell into sin. And so, uh, here we saw three things. The tragic weakness of civilization. And uh, John was looking around and he wept because nobody can... Uh, Open this scroll and break those seals. Nobody in the whole human civilization, from the time of Adam up to the time of the Apostle Paul, no one is qualified to open the, the, the scroll. And so you need to have a kinsman redeemer and a goel, a kinsman redeemer, by the way, as uh, we have uh, taken note last uh, Sunday, he had to be a kinsman. That means he has to be related to the person who lost that land. He, he has to be able, he is willing, and then he had to assume all the obligations of the beneficiary. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is a kinsman, he is a son of Adam, he is a man himself, he is able, he is perfect and without sin, he is even willing to lay down his life, and he had to assume all the obligations. He paid for it all and died on that cross. And so we had the tragic weakness of civilization, and then we saw the triumphant worthiness of Christ. And here, uh, highlighted here, of course, are his uh, Jewish titles. He's of the, uh, the line of the tribe of Judah, Yeshua HaMashiach, that's uh, Jesus the Messiah. And then he is also the root of David. So he descended from David, but at the same time, he is the source of David. So friends, this talks about not only his humanity, it also talks about his divinity. And the worthiness of Christ, we've seen this in three ways. He is worthy. Uh, he is uh, worthy. Number one, uh, he is exclusively worthy. Number two, he is exceedingly worthy. And number three, he is eternally worthy. And exclusively worthy because of his conquest, and uh, because of his cross, and because of his character. And uh, we saw the seven characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, the praise and worship of him his power riches and wisdom and then we saw his strength honor glory and blessing and so that's the perfect uh number seven perfect uh, uh characteristics of the lord jesus christ he is exceedingly worthy also because of the power he projected the price he paid the purpose he promoted and the promise he produced and uh, and so we look at this that he is indeed worthy christ is worthy of all our sacrifices every time you give your money into offering even though your budget is tight all you need to say is lord you are worthy to receive this offering whenever you get tired and you know you feel like giving up and uh, there's no more air you know you cannot hardly breathe anymore because we only have 10 minutes to rest and play the second game for the championship and uh but you gave it all. Uh, you gave it all, your all because He is worthy 
Okay, you did it for the Lord Jesus Christ, even though we're just second place, that's okay. And so we pray for the holiness of Christ. But uh, we praise God for our basket. Wow. And uh, the triumphant uh, work of the Christ. And then lastly, we saw the thrilling worship of creation. And the Lord Jesus Christ is eternally worthy. And we saw the throne that got assembled, the, the truth that was announced. They, there was total agreement there in heaven. They, they were ador uh, the adoration, the thankful adoration, their trusting attitude, and then the true allegiance, bowing their heads or bowing before the throne. And so that's the Lord Jesus Christ that we saw last uh, Sunday. And then we gave you this, and uh, we, we still have some more copies here. By the way, those who got a copy and did not pay. <laughs> to be sure of going to heaven. <laughs> You need to pay, all right? Only two dollars. I already paid the uh, the uh, shipping and then the uh, the taxes. All right. So here you have a, a visual uh, uh, representation of the whole book of Revelation. So just go to uh, to Judy and uh, get a copy. So just two dollars, and we will just go through this uh, as we study uh, this afternoon. Especially chapter 6. But uh, when I was studying chapter 6, I know in my heart that there's something that we need to understand first before we can truly appreciate chapter 6. And this is the book of Daniel. And the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, this is the second key that we need to have to unlock the book of Revelation. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, the 70 weeks. Many of you have read this uh, phrase or this title, the 70 weeks. Well, this afternoon you'll have a you'll have a better understanding, hopefully, of what the 70 weeks prophecy is all about as we uh, go through uh, chapter six as an introduction, study the book of uh, Daniel also. Okay, let's just uh, commit this title to the Lord, shall we? Our Father and our God, Lord, we pray uh, as more details are coming in. Lord, help us to have a, a good grasp of the book of Revelation because as one that data piles up and another data comes in, Lord, we're, we're, we're building the, uh, the puzzle, the, the fuller picture of what the last days will be like. And so our prayer is that each one of us will truly be alert and our minds clear and Lord, we pray that our hearts will be ready to receive your word. And so, Father God, Lord, we just ask that indeed you will bless each one of us as you have promised by reading and heeding your words. And Lord, we pray that indeed we will leave this sanctuary with a special blessing from you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Did you get your copy? People, you got your copy? Come on, insert this always in your Bible because we will go through this, you know. It will be good to always uh, refer to this. Don't just buy it and then leave it at home. And uh, so this will be very important for you to have a, a clear understanding of the uh, book of Revelation. So here's the Lord Jesus Christ about ready to dispatch these uh, horses, the four horsemen that we call in the, uh, the four horsemen. That uh, we call uh, in the book of Revelation. I have entitled this sermon the day of the Lord. Alright? So those who do not have a copy, you can get one. And just make sure that you uh, that you pay so that you will your name will be written in the book of life. <laughs> so just uh, make sure that you have a copy. Alright. I know the Lord Jesus Christ kicked out all the businessmen from the uh, temple area. But the reason for that is because they were making money out of religion. Well, we're not making money, I'm losing money by doing this because you're just paying the two dollars and uh, shipping and taxes already fine. All right, let's go get, get a copy. I mean, it's just two dollar investment and yet you'll have a better picture of the book of Revelation. 
So you have there the church gates. You see that? The church gates. So you have the seven churches. The last church, the church of Odyssea, it means people's uh, rights. And we are in that uh, church age, Laodicea. And do you see what's next? After Laodicea, what's next? Rupture. All right, so we're just awaiting the rupture right now. We're just waiting for the, at the twinkling of an eye, you know, two people are walking and one will just disappear. Husband and wife, they're sleeping on the same bed. The husband woke up and the wife is already gone. And uh, because she went to the market. <laughs> She's already gone for good. And the husband is just wondering why his wife left him all alone. But the thing there is that she's a Christian and the husband was not a Christian. So that's the rupture of the church. And so now after the rupture, you have the seven sealed scrolls. So we go through the seven uh, sealed scrolls. Uh, we'll, we'll just go through that in a little while, all right? Look at the uh, PowerPoint. I want to define, first of all, the title, The Day of the Lord. This is very important because when you enter uh, Revelation chapter, chapter 6, you are now entering the day of the Lord. Alright? So we need to understand this uh, phrase, the day of the Lord. The Jews divided time into two parts. We have the present age and the age to come. The golden age where God himself will reign here on earth, but the present age is where Satan is right, right now uh, reigning over the earth. So what separates the present age and the age to come is what we call the day of the Lord. And as the day of the Lord approaches, that's what we call the last days. Alright, the last days. So we are in the last days. We are just awaiting the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another book because, you know, almost a lot of books are talking about the uh, second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's giving us details, so we need to put them all together so that it will be consistent. The order of events according to the Apostle Paul, based on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, write this down, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, here's the sequence of events. In verse 3, the Apostle Paul said, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day, what day is that? That day, the day of the Lord. That day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness, lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So first of all, in the order of events, you have heard that day will not come, he said, that day of the Lord will not come, first of all, until the rebellion occurs. The rebellion occurs. So that means, friends, there will be the apostasy. The apostasy, the apostasy, the falling away. And the church of Laodicea, there we have the apostasy of the church, where people are, you know, they seem to be calling themselves Christians, and yet Jesus Christ says to them, I'm about to vomit you out, and they're just falling away, and they're, they've lost their first love and everything else, and uh, the apostasy. But then next there, it says there, until the rebellion occurs, and then in verse 7 it says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. The secret power of lawlessness. And the Satan is already is, is here, obviously. Right now, the uh, Antichrist is already here, for sure, he's already been born. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken away, taken out of the way. What does that mean? The secret of the power of lawlessness is already at work. It's already there. But the one who now holds it back, who is restraining the Antichrist, who is restraining the full force of evil in this world, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will continue to do so, restrain through the Christians. The Holy Spirit is working through the churches, through the Christians, until he is taken out, taken out of the way. So that means the Holy Spirit has to be taken away through the church, through the Christians. So the restrainer is removed. Once it's removed, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out, taken out of the way. And then in verse 8, it says there, and then the lawless one will be revealed. It's only when the Holy Spirit through the churches, through the born again Christians, the churches are removed. That's when the lawless one can really come out. But there's nothing more, there's no one that will restrain him anymore. We will recognize him if we're still here at that time. We will recognize him, but the world will not recognize him. Whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. 
And so there we have the, uh, the, the, the third event there is that the map of sin is now revealed. Okay, it's hard to read. Uh, I used a uh, red uh, pen there, a red color font there. The map of sin is now revealed. All right? So the restraint are removed, and that's talking about the rapture. So, friends, as we have uh, discussed this, the rapture will usher in the the lawlessness, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, and that will start the seven year of tribulation. So that's where you have the uh, restrainers removed, and that's the time when we are all ruptured uh, to heaven. And then, there in heaven, you'll have the Bema Sith Judgment. The Bema Judgment, according to 1 Corinthians, is when God will give us the crowns. Okay? The Bema just Judgment has nothing to do with heaven or hell. We're all in heaven already. But we will be given crowns, Stephanus crowns, the victor's crown, depending on what you did here on earth. So the crowns is dependent on your works, but your salvation is dependent on your faith. All right? We put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you go straight to heaven. And when you're in heaven, the crowns that you will receive is dependent on your works. How much are you doing for the Lord? Or are you just taking it, you know, very relaxed in your Christian life? You don't get involved. You know we were there in London, but you did not go. You just watch TV. And, you know, depending, you don't have a, get a medal. The, the kids here, they got a medal because they were there. And uh, again, I mean, I, I, I make a joke out of it, but you know, you know you're in, in your own heart whether you really pulling out your life for the work of the Lord or are you just using your resources for your own selfish gain, for your own comfort, for your own pleasure. You know, you work, you have a high paying job and you use that money just for your own pleasure. And giving tax and offering, you even struggle with that because you want to buy a new shoes, you want to buy a new car, you want, you know, everything you just putting in for your own pleasure. You won't get any reward in heaven. But those people are really sacrificing, you know, they kept shouting there and cheering for the teams and they still have to practice and sing here. They don't have a good voice anymore because, you know, they used up already their voice shouting and cheering. Uh, but friends, you will get a reward. So there's the big man, seat judgment right there in heaven. But also we will have the married supper. How many days of uh, eating and drinking? Seven days in the Jewish tradition, seven days, one week of celebration, and those seven years we are up there celebrating our marriage uh, to our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the church is the bride, the Lord Jesus Christ is the groom. All right, so you have there uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is after seven years, Jesus Christ will come with the church. All right, he will be coming with the church, coming down to earth, and there you have there Armageddon. All right. And so, there are two extremes here that we need to avoid. We know that rupture is just about, uh, just around the corner. We need to avoid, brothers and sisters, what we call rupturitis. 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 You know, rupture paralysis. You know, this happened in the church in Thessalonica because they believe so much in the rupture. You know, they resign from their jobs. You know, they're just waiting for their Jesus Christ to come. They're no longer working. And uh, they became dependent on others. That's uh, rupturitis. Rupture paralysis. We need to keep on working for the Lord. We need to keep on working and serving our families. But the second uh, extreme is what we call rupture mania. And that's, uh, you know, date setting as to when this uh, second coming, uh, this rupture will be. Uh, this guy, the, uh, Edgar Weissman, came up with this book, 88 Reasons Why the Rupture Will Be in 1988. And you know, it was very popular in 1988, but of course he was so uh, humiliated, 1988 came and uh, still no rupture. And then so many others came up with different, uh, uh, different calculations, 2007, 2000, uh, 2011, 1992, you know, so many people making these, uh, these uh, computations. But friends, the Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear. No one, no, not an angel, not even the Lord Jesus Christ knows. Only the Father, he said. And so we're not here to sell dates. So we need to avoid rupturitis and rupture mania. 
But friends, to understand the book of Revelation, the second key, the first key is Revelation 1. First key. Revelation 119. Revelation 119. And that's the outline for the whole book of Revelation. The second key that we need to use is the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. That's the key. If we understand Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, then we will be able to see through this, uh, this series of events that we're about to uh, go through in the, these following Sundays. You know, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, they're very much related. For example, in chapter 7 of Daniel and chapter 13 of Revelation, you can see it's one-to-one -one correspondence. The book of Daniel talks about the lion, then uh, Revelation, lion, bear, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns. You know, one-to-one -one correspondence. In fact, out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, more than half are quotations from the Old Testament. And that's why we need to have an idea of the Old Testament if we are to understand the book of Revelation. And of all the books in the book of in the Old Testament that we need to understand, nothing is more important than the book of Daniel. And friends, I don't, you don't have this in your outline, but you can divide the book of Daniel into two parts. There's the historical part, that's the first six chapters of Daniel, and then there's the visions part, and that's chapter 7 to 12. Historical and then visions. And then the historical part, the chapters 1 to 6, very quickly, Daniel was deported as a teenager, maybe a 13 year old boy when he went there. The Bukhanisar had a dream, chapter 2, the uh, Bauer burn, you know, the uh, Hebrew, three Hebrew kids. The Bukhanisar's pride, and then the fall of Babylon, and then the lion's den in chapter 6. But then in the visions, chapter 7 talks about the types of the Gentiles, the ram and the goat in chapter 8. The 70 weeks in chapter 9, a glimpse of the dark side, the silent years, the consummation of the eight of all things. We're concerned with chapter 9, particularly verse 27. And we're talking about the 70 weeks. So friends, here, here, here's what it means. Chapter 9, you find that Daniel is praying. And while he was praying the first 19 verses, Gabriel appeared. You know, every, every time Gabriel appears, there's a message from God. When he appeared to uh, the Virgin Mary, there's a message from God. And so here, uh, Daniel, uh, Gabriel gave Daniel something that is so profound, the 70 weeks. So we're focused on these chapters 24, no, verses 24 to 27. Verses 24 to 27. I'd like for all of us to read this together, starting with verse 24. All of us, please, ready? Read. Seventy sons are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. No one understands this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of, of the ruler who will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Verse 27. So in these verses, you have the key that will unlock the book of Revelation, particularly starting with chapter 6. So here in the 70 weeks of Daniel, you have the scope verse in verse 24, you have the 69 weeks, you have 1, 7, uh, and then you have, uh, I forgot the actual words, 62, uh, 62 sevens, alright? So 69 weeks, all in all, verse 25, there's an interval in verse 26, and then the 70th week prophecy. Now this word seven or weeks, actually in the original it's weeks, but weeks is uh, translated seven. 
in the Jewish way of understanding, there are seven days. It can be days, like the Sabbath is the seventh day. It can be weeks, so they have the Feast of Weeks. So sevens can be seven weeks, but then it can also be months. So it can be seven months, so from Nisan to Tishri, so you have there. And then it can be even years, so sabbatical years for the land. So seven can be days, weeks, months, or years. Now if you look at verse 25, it says there, Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. There will be a decree that will be coming out. From the time the decree comes out, he said, and then Jerusalem is rebuilt. Okay, the rebuilding of Jerusalem until the anointed one. The anointed one is the Messiah. Okay, the Messiah means the anointed one. Uh, the anointed one, the ruler, comes there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. So that's that's what I was counting. Seven sevens and sixty-two seven. So sixty-two seven plus seven seven. How many? Sixty-nine. Seven plus sixty-two is 69 all right so you have there seven sevens and then 62 sevens so that's 69 sevens or seven 69 weeks and then it says it will be rebuilt what, what will be rebuilt jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and of traps but in times of trouble and then verse 26 and after the 62 sevens you have the seven sevens and then the 62 seven so that means the 69th week after the 69th week the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. So friends, here's what the uh, angel Gabriel gave Daniel. He said from the commandment to restore Jerusalem, up to the time the king, the Messiah, will be presented. It will be 69 times 7, that will be 483 years. 69 times 7, 483 years. Now we know that there are several decrees that were sent out to rebuild Jerusalem. There was the first decree from Cyrus, and because of that decree, they were allowed to go there and rebuild the temple. Darius also gave a decree. Artaxerxes also gave a decree. But then the fourth one that Artaxerxes gave, 445 BC, this is when Nehemiah came and then built the walls around Jerusalem. Remember what was prophesied? It says there, it will be rebuilt with streets and a trench. That means it's not only the temple that will be rebuilt, but the streets of Jerusalem, including a trench. Now, very interesting the word trench here. Uh, street, uh, carots, or trench is actually a wall. That includes the wall, the street and the wall that means friends. From the time of the decree up to the the building of Jerusalem, not just the temple, up to the building of Jerusalem. So we just cancel the, the first three uh, decrees and then we're focused on this last decree by Atlas Verses 445 BC. So now we have the starting date. The command to restore Jerusalem was given March 14, 445 BC. Now it says there that 7 sevens and 62 sevens, that's 69 years, that's 69 times 7. So we have there 69 times 7. Now, the lunar calendar is not the same as the solar calendar. Solar calendar, we have 365 days. The lunar calendar has 360, 360 days, and then they would adjust after several years for the uh, leap years, all right? So the nominal 360-day years were used in the Bible. It's used in Genesis, Daniel, and Revelation. Ancient calendars are also based on the 360-day years. But then, something happened there's some orbital changes and there was the day in joshua remember when the day the sun stood still and so there were these uh differences and so what happens here is from the time the decree of our resources uh Lungimanus was given march 14 445 up to the messiah the king the presentation of jesus christ as king now friends we have this as the uh the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when Jesus Christ presented himself as king. And in fact, he went over Jerusalem because they didn't recognize the importance of this day. This was the day that is fulfilling the prophecy of the 69th week of Daniel when he presented himself as king. So what we have here, oops, I'm sorry. So what we have here is 69 times seven years times 360 days that's 173,880 days after the time he presents himself as king from the time of the uh, decree was given to rebuild Jerusalem. So again, he already presented himself 
So what did he present himself? Well, Christ's ministry began in the fall of 28 AD. We know this because Tiberius was appointed 14 AD. Augustus died in August 19, 14 AD. We can calculate that from secular history. And within the 15th year of Tiberius, on the fourth Passover, this was the time when the Lord Jesus Christ presented himself, April 6, 32 AD. And so, April 6, 32 AD. So what happens here, from March 14, 445 BC, up to April 6, 32 AD, when the Lord Jesus Christ presented himself as king, by the way, something uh, happened here, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, that's the LXX, that's the Septuagint, 300 years before Christ came, the uh, Bible was translated into Greek, and uh, if you calculate now, 445 BC, up to 32 AD, that's 173,740 days. Now from March 14 to April 6, the difference there is 24 days. And then you now add the leap years. The leap years is 116 all in all. The total is 173,880. Exactly 67, 69 times 7 times 360, 160, 173,880 days. So, the, when Jesus Christ presented himself as king, brothers and sisters, that was the time when the 69th week was fulfilled. Five days later, Jesus Christ was crucified. He was not accepted to be their Messiah. They were expecting the Messiah to be the Lion of Judah. Yes, he is a lion, but he has to come here first as a lamb. But the second time he comes here, that's when he will become as a lion. And so now, after this 69th week, it says there in verse 20, this is after the 62 sevens. Remember, there's the seven sevens, and then the 62 sevens. After the 62 sevens, that 69th week, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So there's the prophecy that after the Messiah, the anointed one will be killed. After that, the destruction of the temple. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself prophesied about this. When he talked about the temple, in uh, 70 AD, 40 years later, after he talked about this temple, Jesus Christ pointed to the temple. He said, do you not, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, he said, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Matthew 24. And then the temple indeed was destroyed on September 8th or on September 6, uh, 70 AD. The temple was destroyed in fulfillment. But here's the question of the uh, here's the question of the disciples. The disciples asked, tell us when shall these things be? The destruction of the temple. What shall be the sign of your coming, the second coming, and of the end of the world? There were three questions. That they were interested in. And then the Lord Jesus Christ, in answering this, gave them this quotation from the book of Daniel. He said, So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. So here in Matthew 24, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving them a very clear signal that the fulfillment of the 69th week will be the 70th week. When you see standing in the holy place, and the holy place of course is the temple, right now we don't have a temple yet, but when that, uh, when the Antichrist stands there, then that's the abomination that causes desolation. And so Daniel 9.27, friends, here's the key, all right? Here's the key. He will confirm a covenant, he here is the Antichrist. The Antichrist will confirm a covenant with many for how many? One seven. That would be seven years. In the middle of the seven, what will be the middle of the seven? Three and a half years. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. So for the first three and a half years, they will be offering, but on the middle, three and a half years, he will offer himself. He will stand in the very uh, holy of holies, and that's the uh, desolation. At the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is pulled out on him. So friends, the day of the Lord, the 69th week, and then there's an interval now, that, that interval is almost 2,000 years now, and then the 70th week. So included in that interval, of course, is the uh, 
the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the temple is destroyed. I use the red the color there, so the red cannot be seen. And then the seventh year three is the uh, that's the uh, seven years. In the middle of that, the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist will enter. Seven years will be false peace. All right. And then the second half that will be the great tribulation. So that's the seventieth week. Before the seventieth week, there will be the rapture. The uh, restrainer will be removed, and that's the Holy Spirit, and the Christians will be removed. And then after seven years, the Jesus will come back. That's the second coming at the end of the seventieth uh, week. And so, as I've said, there will be the big Bema judgment there in heaven. The giving away of the awards, and then there will be the uh, the uh, marriage supper. All right, so that's the picture now. So friends, the seventieth week. Oops, you cannot see the red. That's Revelation six up to nineteen. All right. So I just placed in context what Revelation chapter six up to verse up to chapter nineteen is all about. So the seventieth week is the day of the Lord, and that is what is described in Revelation chapter 6. So here's a picture so that you can see. So there's the 70th week uh, of Daniel. So here, at the uh, start of the first three and a half years, you have the seven seals right there. After the seven seals, you have the seven trumpets. In the middle is the abomination of desolation. Chapters 11 to 13, that's the middle portion. And then the last half, the last three and a half years will be the the bias that will be poured on the earth. And so it will be succession of a one punishment after another. And uh, friends, I already prepared, by the way, the manual for those of you who might be left behind. <laughs> I'm going to print it. And uh, one family should have a copy and just put it somewhere there. You know, if somehow your children are so hard-headed that they won't really commit themselves to the Lord, at least they know where to find this, because once your parents are already ruptured and you're alone at home, you can play all the video games that you want, you know, you can drive the car, Josiah, you can drive if you want, if you're left, but I know you'll be going with me, I know my son is a Christian, I have no doubt about that, but again, I already prepared it, and so, friends, these seven years, I tell you, once we go through this, you know, the, the four horsemen, the one calamity after another, here's, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're left behind, most likely, you will not survive. Most likely, you will not survive. You will not survive physically, all right? Spiritually, that's what we're concerned about. You still have a chance to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. You still have a chance to go to heaven. But physically, I doubt if you'll survive. Because during these, three, during these seven years, out of four, if we, if, we, if we are four billion, three billion will die. So, three out of four people will die during these seven years of tribulation. I mean, that's a lot of people. I mean, three billion dying, wow. That's one calamity after another. In fact, at the end of chapter 6, you will read there that the people who were still around, they would hide in the mountains, they would hide under the caves, and they were just shouting to the Lord Jesus Christ, just kill us now, just kill us! Patayin na kami! Because we cannot handle it anymore, the pain is just so much, they just wanted to die. But even that, their prayers were not answered. They have to go through so much suffering. And so friends, I'm going to print that and uh, I hope every family will get a copy and uh, that one is for free, all right? <laughs> so, uh, yes. So we're closing now. Again, I barely touched chapter 6, but friends, once you understand this, chapter 6, chapter 7, we'll just, we'll just go through it very quickly because here's the thing, Pastor Roy, if I'm already in heaven, why do I need to study chapter 6, chapter 7, up to chapter 19, and why I'm already in heaven? Well, friends, the reason why God gave us chapter 6 to chapter 19 is so that right now, before the rapture, 
you will have enough burden to share the gospel with your loved ones so that they don't have to go through the tribulation. So that you will see for yourself how painful it is to be left behind. Oh, I tell you, to be left behind during that time. It's the worst nightmare, your worst nightmare. This is also for the time of Jacob's trouble. Look at this. At the time of Michael, you know Michael? The Archangel Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. Did you see those, this, that description? The things that are going to happen, never, never, since the start of mankind here on earth, it has never been experienced. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. If your name is written in the book of life, friends, you don't have to be afraid because you'll be ruptured and go to heaven. And then, time of Jacob's trouble, here's the reason why God would allow the, his people, the, the Jews, again, the Jews will be left behind. The Jews who are not Messianic Jews, most of them, during the seven years, that's the time for their conversion. Here's what it says. Then, I will return to my lair until they have burned all the centuries rejecting the Messiah and the Gentiles experiencing the grace of God. But after that, after they go through the misery, that's the time when they will earnestly seek the Lord Jesus Christ. And so friends, uh, chapter uh, 6, I, just, I, I, I would just like to end here. I just want to give you the uh, outline so that at least you can fill up that so that we don't have to uh, go through that next Sunday. But this is a very important uh, background here that I've just given you. And I tell you, I had several nights of just really having a hard time going through all these details and putting all of this so that it will be clear to you. All right? Here's the thing that you will notice. When you start reading chapter 6, okay, here's the, we have here the, uh, the seven uh, seals. You will notice here that there's a design. There's a pattern. It's called a hypnotic pattern or structure. First, you will have the seven seals. Now, when you reach the sixth seal, there will be like a parenthesis right there. The battery is very low. There's a parenthesis right there before the seventh seal. And uh, that parenthesis on the seventh seal, that's actually the opening for the seven trumpets. The seventh seal is the opening of the seven trumpets. After seven trumpets, six trumpets, again there's a lot. There's a parenthesis, chapters 10 to 14. Alright? There's the parenthesis. And then the seventh trumpet opens up the seven balls or the seven vials. Alright? So the seven vials is now opened up. And then after the sixth vial, again there's a parenthesis right there, just one verse. And then you have the seventh vial. So that's the that's the uh, pattern that we see here in this uh, in these uh, judgments. So the four horsemen, as we have called them, just write down in your outline. There are four letter D's right there. So here you have the uh, four horsemen. The first is a, a white horse. In verse two, I looked, and there before me was a white. I'm sorry, was a white uh, was a white horse. Oops was a white horse, its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. So first letter is dominion. This is not Christ, or he's riding a white horse at the end of uh, chapter uh, 20, but here in chapter 6, this is the Antichrist. He will be, uh, he will be, instead of Christ, and peace instead of Christ, he will come, and uh, he will provide that peace, and he will have dominion, but this is false peace. And then verses 3 and 4, when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. So the second one is the, 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 the destruction. And so because of this false peace, people, they really want to have peace. And to protect them, they have to kill each other to protect that, uh, that, that peace. And so Satan is going to use that as a, uh, uh, a way to manipulate people. If you want peace, then you have to submit to me. And then verse 5 and uh, verse 6. When that opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, I look, and there before you is a black horse. It's like you're holding a pair of scales in his hand. Ah, scales. 
in his hand. Then I heard what sounded a voice from the poor little creature saying, two pounds of wheat for a day's wages. So what happens here is you'll have to work the whole day in order to buy a loaf of bread. Economically, it will be disastrous. All right? You need to work the whole day just to buy a loaf of bread. And so here we have the deprivation, the deprivation, people will be deprived, all right? So that's the third horseman, the black horse. Many will die. On the second horse, the red horse, many will die. That's military, but this one is starvation, famine, deprivation. And then verse 7 and 8, when the Lamb opened the port seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come, I looked. And there before me was a pale horse. Now this word pale is not actually the actual Greek. It's chloros, chloroform. You know, it's actually a greenish, a yellowish greenish uh, color. You know, when you have gun green, it's it's green. That's the color here. It's not it's not a pale horse. It's green, actually yellowish green. Uh, its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over the court of the earth to kill by sword. Famine and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. Wow, a fourth of the earth. So that means if there are four billion, one billion will die already. We're just on the first series of uh, of the calamities here, friends. It's, it's just the first. When you reach the trumpets, more will die because this time there will be heavenly things that will be falling on earth, and then the last will be the worst, the violence. Wow. So this time you have here decimation. One billion people will die. Just this, uh, this green horse. One billion will just die. I, I don't know if you can imagine one billion. More than two hundred thousand died in the tsunami in uh, in uh, in Indonesia. Two hundred thousand is already a lot of bodies floating. But friends, can you imagine one billion people dying? Just this. Uh, green horse, this fourth horseman, the decimation. And then, verses 9 and 10, when he opened the field, I saw that after the souls of those who had been slain, because of the word of God. Now, these are Christians. That's why I told you, if you're a Christian during that time, most likely you will not make it. Physically. Because the Antichrist will search you, he will email, he will watch your email and everything, everything is already recorded. They will know that you're a Christian and you will be caught. That's, that's, you know, that's already a deal. So most likely, if you're a Christian during the tribulation period, you will not survive physically, but you will survive spiritually. And that's what's really important. You should be willing to die for Jesus. Never, never accept the mark of the Antichrist. If you accept the mark, friends, for sure, you're going to hell. For sure, you're going to hell. If you accept the mark, no salvation for you. No salvation if you accept the mark. So by all means, just die physically. Just go through the torture. Anyway, you'll go straight to heaven. All right? Then each of them was given a white robe. You know, you'll be uh, a robe of righteousness. They were told a little, wait a little longer until the full number of the fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Just as they had been. So many Christians during the tribulation period, the seven years period, many Christians will die. In chapter 7, we have 144,000 missionaries, the Jewish Christians, 144,000 missionaries. But there, the discrimination is the fifth seal. You'll be discriminated because you're a Christian and they will, you will be put to death. That's what it means. So bad Christians are dying, billion of them. Christians are dying because Satan will search you out and then Lastly, in verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth. Wow, that's a meteor shower. A sphinx fall from a victory when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. Wow, I, I don't think you can picture this. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Can you imagine that kind of earthquake to remove the islands and the mountains from its place? An earthquake that has never been experienced. The, the, the strongest earthquake so far in history is 
is the 10, uh, Richter, 10 in the Richter scale. Seven is already the one that we have in Japan, is seven point something, but the strongest in Krakatoa, Indonesia is 10, the Richter scale of 10. But this earthquake is stronger than that earthquake because of the volcano, vol volcanic eruption of Krakatoa, where there was a deluge and there was an earthquake of a magnitude of 10 in the Richter scale. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, he in caves, and among the rocks of the mountains, they call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can withstand it? So friends, there's the disruption right there. There's the disruption. The disruption of everything, the mountains will be disrupted, the islands will be dislocated, and uh, wow, the whole earth is shaking. There's no way you can hide from this. And then there's a digression. This digression here is chapter 7. So before he went to the seventh seal, he discussed first the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish missionaries, Jewish evangelists. 144,000. Can you imagine Do you know right now? We only have about close to 50,000 missionaries. People outside their own country who are abroad, about close to 50,000. During the time of the tribulation, the seven years tribulation right there, 144,000 missionaries. These are the Jewish missionaries who are willing to die for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not afraid of death because now they know their Messiah. And so friends, right there in chapter 7, it's the anointing or the sealing of the 144,000 Jewish missionaries. And then finally, uh, silence of 30 minutes on earth, uh, in heaven, and then the seven trumpets begin, uh, begins. And that's uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. You have another series of calamities with the seven trumpets. Grab it. I thought the seals would be bad enough, but friends, that's just an introduction. After the seven seals, the seven trumpets will be worse than the first. And then, even worse than the trumpets will be the violence. With the trumpets, Satan and the uh, angelic host of Satan, the, the evil spirits will come down and then torture people here. Can you imagine being tortured by demonic spirits? That's the, that's the trumpets. And then the violence. So friends, what am say, what, what, what I saying here? Maybe right now you're saying to my Lord, sorry, you're just scaring us. Well, friends, I wish, I wish I could scare you. I wish I could scare you. If I could scare you, I would. Brothers and sisters, I would rather scare you to go to heaven than to allow you to go to heaven. If you really understand, start reading Revelation chapter 6, chapter 7 up to chapter 19. If you really understand what we're about to go through, what this earth is about to go through, friends, you wouldn't want your mother-in-law to stay here. I know some of us are mother-in-law, we want them, okay, just stay here. You know, sometimes we feel that way. My mother-in-law was very good. She already passed away. And she's, uh, you know, she's in heaven. But, uh, you know, your worst enemy, even your worst enemy, you wouldn't wish your worst enemy to stay here during the tribulation. You would want to share the gospel with your worst enemy. If we truly understand what this earth is about to go through. Amen? Yes. Let's just bow our heads, shall we? Almighty God, Lord, we just uh, pray. We know this, these are just details. And yet, Lord, we know that in the midst of all these details, in the midst of all this misery, these calamities, Lord, we know your grace is present. Lord, we know your will is that no one should come, should perish, but everybody should come to repentance. And so, Lord, our prayer, my prayer for each one of us, Lord, we pray that each one of us here at Chapter Life, Lord, will really have the burden to share the gospel with someone else. Lord, we will truly have that desire for people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And so, Father God, Lord, we just commit our search to you this afternoon. We pray that you will just nurture this desire right now and that would really cause us, Lord, to sacrifice if we need to sacrifice, spend if we need to spend, just so that we may share the gospel with someone else. And so, Lord, we pray that you will build this compassion in our hearts. Give us, grant us, Lord, that, that kind of heart. And so, Father God, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you right now. Thank you again for this study, even as we continue next Sunday. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you have some announcements?